with Bradley Cooper here, Steve Morrow, Sign Hi. Sound. There's so much to talk about with this movie. Um, Bradley, I, this is your last Q&A for this film. And I wanted to start... You never know. <laughs> you know what? That's a fair point. <laughs> I wanted to start with uh, the word no, which is a word you heard quite a bit in chopping this movie around. Um, and in reflection, as we come to the end of the season, I'm curious how you reflect on that, and particularly sticking to the vision that you had for this film, which obviously turned out uh, pretty great. Uh, I, under I understood it. I mean, I never took it personally. Um, you're going to make a movie with a 1-3-3 aspect ratio that's half of it's in black and white and you want to shoot in black and white film stock so there's no going back about a uh, classical musician and it's mainly about his marriage. Yeah, I get why they were like, no. <laughs> and you want to shoot all the music live so it's going to cost a lot of money? Yeah, I, 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 I was like, you know, I got it. Um, it was disappointing because I believed that there was a real compelling movie and I thought the music was nuclear. Um, but I never really took it personally. I think that's also par probably why I've maintained a positive attitude in this business for so long. Is that, um, yeah, I just don't really, you can't really take it, because then you're, you know, it's not a good place, headspace. But yeah, the answer is uh, Scott Stuber is the only person who believed in the vision of the film out of the whole, basically the whole town. I shot, tried to get it made. Um, so if it wasn't for him, we, the movie never would have gotten made. Can you take us inside exactly what that pitch was that they got to the yes? Uh, um, Did I, you see a Star is Born? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you saw a Star is Born. It Morgan. should be that simple. Yeah, it uh, be. You know, I mean, I, I walked through the beginning of the movie. I had the beginning of the movie in my head for like five and a half years ago. So that thing you hear to the timpani of On the Waterfront, I walked him through that whole thing of the phone ringing and he gets the call and he goes down. It's all one shot. Then he gets thrust into the Carnegie Hall. Cause, um, so that was like, and I would play the music and talk through it. So I had that, um, I had the Mahler, um, and, but that was kind of it, you know. <laughs> and, and just my enthusiasm and, and, and having it shown him a star is born and that I was so clear that I thought that there was enough here for, for there to be really something to, to chew on with their, this relationship and this family. And then I played him the Mahler too from the YouTube and said, we're gonna recreate this. And that was the other thing I would do. And then he said yes? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the sound. He said yes to a script. Yes. And then, then, then there's many, you know, it's a long road. Uh, including, of course, the sound design, which is so ingenious in this film. Uh, can you talk about your initial work with Steve, how you guys connected on this, and what those initial conversations Absolutely. were? Absolutely, like? yeah. Uh, Steve and I met on The Star is Born. Uh, which, which uh, I, we sort of fell in love with each other. Uh, I, I, I watched Jason Reitman's movies and I, and I realized just all this overlapping dialogue, I just fell in love with it. and It felt like all of the background players were actually speaking. And, and, so, uh, and Steve had done the, the mixing of that. So uh, we met and then we met in my house in, in LA and then we talked about that and talked about shooting the music live for Star is Born, I'm talking about. So the vocals live, and he said, you know, I think I, we can do all those things, because he, he had also done La La Land, and I had asked him about some of that stuff was shot live with Emma, especially, yeah. uh, that one scene yeah, in, the, right. in the apartment. Um, and so, so then, we, and then we just had the most incredible experience together. And the mixing crew also, uh, Tom and Dean, uh, Tom, who I was who I'd worked with the, with the Un-American Sniper. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, heading into this one, we knew we were going to do this while we were still in post on The Star is Born, so that was really exciting. And, uh, and this one was really challenging sonically, like way more challenging than A Star is Born. And I think we all sort of went into it uh, with fear, uh, but excitement too, to try to push ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, 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 um, a lot of the movie happens in, in quiet you know, spaces and quiet conversations where you know, the dialogue's just hanging out there, the, the actors are just hanging out there, there's no score that is telling you how you should feel about the scene, you're just watching the scene and watching these two people interact, and that's kind of the magic of the movie. You know, on a sound level, it's, you know, you're hearing wind and birds and things that are, are natural, but they're also helping tell that story and tell the emotion, and I think that that's something that Tom and Dean and, and uh, Jason Reuter and all those guys really nailed, you know, in the mix. To, to, and, and I know that you were there, 
you know, kind of between everybody and just kind of putting your magic on it. Because I don't, you know, he ha he touches every part of this movie. So if it succeeds in your brain, it's a, it's you know, 99.9 percent .9 him, you know, one percent, you know, everybody trying their hardest to, to keep up with him. And it really does. If the movie failed, we could all blame him. And if the movie <laughs> succeeds, we can, you know, then he gets all the credit because it really is his vision, and and the crew is there to really, you know put it forward and make make sure that the movie he wants is the movie that we deliver. So let's start with talking about the dialogue. I love that you mentioned the overlapping dialogue, Bradley, because there's a kind of musicality to it that I, I so love in this film and that really popped to me the second time I saw it. Um, starting with the script stage, like you and Josh Singer working on this together, it's very evident, I think, in the construction. Um, can you walk us through how you got to that kind of rhythm? Based on the primary source material, uh, because it's based on actual people, and we had the advantage of the Bernstein children, uh, and also there's just so much footage uh, and audio of them speaking, and it really was the melody of their, their actual speaking voices, and Lenny was just so melodic in the way he spoke, it was infectious. Uh, and also for Felicia and their children, and all of their friends, quite honestly, even Shirley. Um, so we took a, a that that was our benchmark for how we wrote and and I remember like one of the first scenes was when they first meet outside of Claudia Rouse uh, when they play they play that game can they remember their own biography um, and that was uh, that was one of the first times I felt like we keyed into the rhythm uh, because all that was exactly how we wrote it and it kind of had to be said that way in order for uh, for me to be able to stay in that take for one take. I mean, if we took our time, <laughs> we, we, it wasn't going to work. The movie would have fallen apart. Um, and, they, and, and also the excitement of people in their 20s sort of sharing ideas. Um, and then as he gets older, it's that same melody, but it's just, it's actually, it's a little more legato. Uh, but, but the whole movie is constructed in a way that it's one musical element of much of that not being the music, actually just being the dialogue scenes. So what are the particulars that you're looking at in, in that process of, of really capturing that melody? Well, I mean, in capturing the melody, you just, especially with overlapping dialogue, you just want to make sure everybody is is mic properly and, and recorded properly, or, or else you're going to have this blur of dialogue that's not going to be uh, understandable, and that's that's the problem. You know, sometimes if you do a ton of overlapping dialogue, so the goal was always, well, let's get this as clean as we can, so that everybody, so you guys can understand it. Um, but that was, you know, the challenge that he put forward and Jason Redman put forward in the past, and we were pretty comfortable that we'd be able to do that. So the biggest challenge was the, the live music stuff. That's where we had a hard attack. That said, though, you, you do give yourself the challenge of this party scene <laughs> yeah. where you're miking more than two people, let's right. say, which is not typically done. Um, I would imagine that's much tougher to get that kind of clean audio you're talking about while still getting that really rare feeling of the buzz of a party as you do. Yeah, I mean, I think when you, I mean, we've all experienced the party, you know, in real life, and so we know what, what that sounds like, and it doesn't have to be crystal clear, clean, it just has to be understandable, you know, and I think that when you put actors into a situation where it's real, and this was always what Bradley was striving for, is just, you know, let's just, let's just start filming, let's not, you know, map this all out, let's just make this real, uh, so it feels real, so if you put everybody into a party and just say, go ahead and talk, you know, then, then you're able to accomplish something that feels real because it is real, and the, the cast members have to talk over each other if you want to be heard, just like at any other party. We all yell into each other's ears at a party to be heard, so we had to do the same thing, and, you know, each take, we, you know, okay, hard to hear this person, let's go tell, you know, give them a note, or, or not, you know, it'd be perfect every time, and then you just move on, but, yeah, you, you had to mic everybody, all the cast, and then mic as many of the people around the cast, and then do some plant mics and do some overhead boom mics just to get as much information as you can so that you could spread it out into the theater. But the, the other very helpful uh, talent of Steve, because it's not just simply miking everybody, but he's live mixing it as it's occurring. So he has the script here, there, but also many people are improvising because it's a party. And I would just run to him very quickly and say, you know, focus on uh, maybe these two people who were talking to Felicia, who we just talked about a scenario to talk about, and then he's creating a live mix that then I would be able to edit with with the editor, yeah. and that was a huge uh, advantage because because he we had all everything that we wanted, and and there's no ADR in this movie, which is kind of incredible, and that's really due to his uh, mixing and sound ability. Yeah, and it also has to do with the whole the rest of the crew being respectful of, and the fact that process. I have bad hearing, so I, I'm like, yeah, sounds great. <laughs> 
Yeah, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even listen to me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good to me. No, it's great. <laughs> Imagine the no ADR is, is a goal going in. Does it feel like a high wire act to know that you there's essentially no going back? Then no, I, I don't think so. I mean, every movie has its challenges, and if something you know, if you're shooting a whisper scene next to the freeway, it's going to happen. You know, you're going to you're going to have to replace it. But no, I mean, your goal is always to capture the performance as it's happening because that's the most raw it's ever going to be. And, and I just feel like you always can tell when it's ADR. It's yeah, like, it's like you always. You just always can tell, yeah. and it takes you out of the movie for like a second, and then you're back in. But but it does get take you out for a second. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you just want to get it. You want to get it on the page. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the party scene is a real centerpiece in, in the story of this marriage, which is obviously the the crux of this film. So I'd love to go back a bit, Bradley, um, to really ask you about what drew you to this particular marriage. The, canon of marriage in cinema is very long and, and storied, uh, and yet this film still feels so distinctive in the way it tells its story. I'm curious what about it. I think it was like, what, what's the reason to make this film? Like, what, and movies for me have always been something that uh, makes me feel like I'm not alone, uh, and then it sort of reflects something in me that maybe I wasn't willing to face. Um, those are the movies that, uh, that, that's why movies have affected me since I was a kid. So it really felt like Lenny, the way he lived his life, and primarily in relationship to uh, this woman that he committed himself to, to a degree, um, had so many potholes and 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 so many uh, such ugliness, but at the same time such beauty and joy. It just kind of in, he kind of lived a life that encap encapsulated sort of every possible element of the human experience. I don't know how he did it, and well, he didn't survive that long. He died, in, you know, when he was seventy-two, but. Um, but I just found him just so fascinating. I thought, well, there, there is a, if we could sort of focus on that and this relationship and do it in a way that rhythmically is to his music, because that's the other real joy was working with his music. And because it's so chronicled and, you, and, and to just make a movie about just his achievements felt like not something that would benefit us even as, as storytellers. But to do this, to try to do this, to try to accomplish this, was a feat worth trying to do. Because hopefully the movie ends and when you actually see Lenny conducting there at the end, you feel like you know him, hopefully, and not just sort of looking at this archetypal figure. And if you never even knew who he was, you feel like you know him. And then when it says music by Leonard Bernstein, my hunch is maybe people weren't even realizing that they had been listening to his music the whole movie, for the most part. Yeah, there's a, a number of, uh, I would say, cuts that you have to make, right, in telling the story in terms of his biography. You spent years on this project. I imagine you knew the man inside and out. So when it came to the actual process of getting down to a script, can you walk us through maybe some of the tough decisions you had to make in terms of what couldn't be in, even sure. if it was an iconic part of Yeah, I mean, Young People's Concert was a huge thing. Fifteen seasons, and it's so cinematic, and we had a scene where Jamie and, and Felicia are there, and he's doing this uh, monologue about Mahler and the, being the two-faced sides of Mahler. But then you start thinking about, like, what are repeated beats? Well, he talks about that in the Murrow interview, and he does teach William. So those boxes are checked. So what is really this about? And the same thing with the uh, Black Panther party. Um, it, we had that. That was how we entered into the 70s, was that party at the Dakota was that. And it just thought, well, then you have Tom Wolfe and there's a villain. And like, well, how does that fit into a movie about marriage and really he, his inner life or his his duplicity or whatever we want to talk, even though it's not duplicity, but his complications are kind of the villain in the movie. So how does Tom Wolfe fit in? And it just you just start to just sort of dissect what's needed and what has to what's close to the vein of the film, which is this marriage. And then things just fall away. There was a whole vacation in Ancedonia, Italy that we had scouted and prepped and we're gonna shoot. And in the end I thought, but they didn't take vacations in Italy. So you see like Lenny walking around in a speedo, you think like, oh that's what the way this family was, but it was like a one off and it really wouldn't reflect just what a workaholic he was. And as you said earlier, the, the music really tells a lot of that story, fills in a lot of those blanks. So how did you think about the trajectory of the soundtrack and, and the mix as well in terms of the way you talked about it? You know, it, it's sort of something that, um, like most of the movie, it, it told us. I mean, the timpani was always the beginning. Mahler, too, was always an anchor. Fancy Free and On the Town was always an anchor for the musical theater. 
Um, but, you know, uh, Felicia's, the anniversary to Felicia, uh, Psalms, I, I was in love with that Psalms uh, piece, but I never knew where it was going to be, and it really didn't find itself at the end until later in the movie. Make Our Garden Grow originally was going to be Lenny conducting at the Barbican when he was old, but then we realized, like, let's just, you know, show the shark once, and that's Mahler too. So it's just sort of as you're shooting, things start to reveal themselves. For you, how did you think about that part of the film? Yeah, I mean, on, honestly, you know, his script is is mapped out with what songs are going where, for what scenes. I mean, it, they're really well thought out, and so we had a list of all the songs. We had all the songs on set, so we would play them during rehearsals or during the scene, depending on whether there's dialogue or not, which really informed camera moves and, and mood and, and feeling, so that really helped, I think, you know, tell the story the way that it was it was conceived in, in you know, in their brain, so... Yeah, which was very helpful, you know, because then everybody's on the same page. Yeah. And we had a lot of time to prep, so we were able to talk about that with the whole, yeah. with everybody. So everybody was aware of the sort of the, the nature of how we were going to shoot scenes. Yeah, I mean, the Ely Cathedral is so well-timed, you know, the, 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 it's one shot on a crane, it's so well-timed to be over her shoulder right when he finishes. And that's Mango, who's, you know, Dolly Grip, who's amazing. But he sat there with headphones and an iPod for hours, just you know, playing it back, memorizing the timing, so that he could really make that move. We actually did it with it, uh, and then I played her, and then we had like, cause we would make sure the camera would hit the bow, the, yeah. the bows, because we didn't want to do it with all the the orchestra there. It was too embarrassing how long it would take to yeah. prep, yeah. and they're just sitting there. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of people looking so around just like over like, the bow, like I think it's how long. I don't know. <laughs> We're pretending. <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> We were like, just don't come in. <laughs> Close that right now. It's very private. <laughs> well, as long as we're on the cathedral yeah. scene, let's let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, Bradley, this, this scene, as far as I know, has been with you basically as long as you wanted to make this movie. Um, how did you first envision it, and how did it evolve over the years in which you were you know, practicing, conducting, and things like that? Uh, at first, I really envisioned the whole thing playing on her face. Mm -hmm. And it was one going to be one shot that started at the top. And I used to visit that cathedral. I went to Ely like years before, probably maybe three or four times by myself, and finally got access up to this place and would take photos and talk to Maddie Lepatique about it and Mango and Scott Sakamoto, the camera crew. And, and then we figured out a way to, to, to hang a cable cam. We set the whole thing up. And, and then, um, but when we were doing it, I had already used that shot for her when she was sick. And I was like, you can't do it twice. And I realized that, wait, I, I think all this was out of fear that I wasn't going to be able to actually do it properly. So just don't have the camera on me. And, um, and then I realized, like, no, you have to. This is the, the whole scene is about her. You know, what is the scene about? As opposed to just, like, wanting to do Mahler too. Uh, and once, it, once I realized, like, what the scene was about, then, that, then the shot became very clear. Um, and the key to that was always, uh, you know, Ozawa, who just passed away, a conduct, famous conductor who was a mentor, a protege of uh, Lenny's, had this wonderful thing that he talked about Mahler. It wasn't as if Mahler was very complicated to conduct, but to get inside of it, the music was, that was the real um, challenge. And that I was very aware of. So it was just trying to find a place of feeling like I could get inside of that piece and, and, and fill it with the joy that you see clearly see Lenny have so that was really the work to hope to get that because then that's what the scene's about because she sees it and you realize there's no hate in his heart the challenge of recording it live i imagine was an enormous one so and i would also assume that that was pretty much there from the get-go so what were your early conversations about what you needed how many mics things like that well it was really uh bradley mentioned he wanted to do it live and we kind of thought he was joking for a minute and then uh, <laughs> and we realized that he wasn't joking and then uh you know there was a part of us that was a little bit soothed knowing that he's going to conduct in front of the best orchestra on the planet and so the pressure is really going to be on him not necessarily on us recording it, you know, because... Yeah, because they, they, they're fine on their own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. More than... In fact, yeah. you're getting in the way, let's be honest. <laughs> except, for, except for that, the last shot. That was, the, that was when they all... The, the entire orchestra agreed that was it. They even went up to him and said, that was it. That's the one you use. Like, yeah. But, uh, no, I think, I think, you know, we we reached out to the LSO and they said, hey, you should talk to Classic Sound in London. They, they record us all the time, and so... We reached out to them, and they said, oh, yeah, we, Ely Cathedral, we've done that before. We said, well, we haven't done it like this, you know, but, we, you know, this is going to be for a movie in Dolby Atmos, and, and so it's going to require a lot of, a lot more microphones than, than what a classical um, 
but also we have to do it in a way that's not doesn't look like a scoring session you know or else this is going to get in the way you can have mics in front of people you can do certain things because Lenny was always recorded but uh, it was that piece yeah was, yeah but it couldn't be crazy you know so we had to hang a lot from the from the ceiling and we took we took a lot out of the post too yeah. over there good visual effects and um, but yeah it was it was daunting but we had lots of conversations about it and horror stories about pigeons potentially ruining everything and you know because that that was the the horror stories of Ely Cathedral was like well you can't really control the pigeons that are up above it um, but you know it was we basically kind of just you know most of the movie was was guided you know almost by Lenny you know from above just saying we got this you got this so we came in pretty pretty well prepared pretty calm just praying that nothing shut down on us and then handed it over you know that was it yeah, it was all it was all his work you know I mean it's just like you know there's nothing else you can do you just sit there just a giant smile on your head you know, I like, think so <laughs> yeah it was joy it was so much joy to do that I wanted to ask Bradley uh, about the makeup a little bit um, but in that scene particularly, because you're so active and um, passionate, uh, was it a different kind of job you had to have that day? Like, what did that? Yeah, and that's like? all. That's all manufactured. I'm I'm drenched underneath, but you don't see any of that. All that is like, in, you know, big spray bottles. Kazu, who's just a genius, you know, us talking about like, you know, being flushed. But that's all makeup, and that's all wet and oil. None of it is actually me. Uh, and it's just incredible that he's uh, able to do that. I mean, he's just a master. He it's also kind of said that, he, that was his horror scene, too. Like, he was like, I've never had an actor have his mouth open so wide. Yeah. Have it so wet. <laughs> no, the thing that he would hate, I was always like, more wet, more wet. He's like, no, no, no. And I'm like, no, 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 no please, Cosmo, no. Like, <laughs> it's like an hour and a half in. Like, yeah. This is the end of the whole Mahler, too, is that piece. He's been up there for an hour, you know. And it's um, a, it's a, yeah, but it is the, it's the thing that I would, I mean, it was a, 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 the illusion that I would always, I'd be like, oh, I'm sweating, like, <laughs> like wait, no, I'm not. <laughs> but then when they would finally take it off, I would be drenched, oh absolutely God. drenched. Hey, I can't imagine how much weight you lost on the movie. A Just lot. Wear it all that time. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy, yeah. yeah. It was great for the prosthetic, though. And then I realized the more weight I lost, the better the prosthetic looked. And by the end, Cosmo and I thought, wait, maybe we should just do this all again. Because like, we finally nailed it in like the last week. And Netflix was like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> That's enough. That's it. That's it. Kazu's work is really astonishing here. That scene being one obvious example, but I, I always think about just the sheer amount of time that it has to cover and the intricacy of every period. How did that help you find different eras of Lenny, versions of Lenny, because even in your voice there's such an evolution? Yeah, that, again, that was a, a blessing of finding the anchor in the story of this marriage, because the only way to tell it was to go through these decades of when they beat the 24 up until past her death and then into the 80s. And that brought with it so many op opportunities cinematically. And then, you know, had an incredible team, Mark Bridges, the costume designer. I mean, Lenny's sort of evolution of his attire was very fun. <laughs> you know, and he even says in the part, you know, if I was left to my own device, I'd dress like a clown. And it's like, yeah, and you see when he leaves her. Well, you could say he's a clown or not, but, you know, sort of cashmere Formula One outfits and, you know, kind of, <laughs> yeah, it was, fun to, it was fun to play that part. Um, and then just all the locations. Again, this is like a New York story, like being, and then and also in Carnegie Hall and the Dakota, and then Tanglewood and then Ely. It was just, it was just, it really was like, that definitely the most incredible experience I've ever had. That we were, and we all felt like because we were in all these hallowed grounds that they that they were there. Yeah, we we filmed in their house. I mean, in, yeah, in Fairfield is yeah. the house that's still there, and they basically untouched by Felicia, who designed yeah, the, it. The country home. Yeah, the country home that's in black and white and color for our film. It's amazing details. I mean, I I also think of the scene uh, where you were speaking with your daughter, Bernstein's daughter. Yeah. Uh, and you don't tell her the truth when yeah. she asks you, and I'd seen you say that there's a moment. As for you as an actor, where you feel like you want to scream the truth at her. Yeah. I, 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 can you talk about just Lenny coming through you in that way? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the things that was exciting about the film uh, was that the, it's a play a, to, to tell a story about a guy who really didn't lie. And this isn't a story about him having a sort of double life and lying to his wife. Like, he was just open, open, and, and really no inner monologue. And this is sort of who he is. And 
And that's and, and because he had so many gifts, it was a hard thing to be around. As she said, you suck the air out of the room and leaves no, nothing else for us. Um, but there's also, that's a very uh, infectious, uh, appetizing person to be around too. So there's, there's an example where the one time in the whole film where he lies, um, and it almost kills him to do it, and he just doesn't want to do it when he hears his daughter say that she's relieved. You know, it kind of goes against everything that he feels that he would want to teach her, uh, but he's doing it for maybe his to protect himself in terms of his marriage to his wife, and also if he did say it, we would have to figure out another fight scene, <laughs> and then <laughs> our schedule would be completely upended. <laughs> right, don't say it. Don't, don't say it. Don't, 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 don't do it. <laughs> The effect of not saying it, though, is, is what you were saying earlier, this emphasis on quiet, right? And, yeah. and the holding in that kind of agonizing silence. Yeah, I mean, I, there are many scenes in this movie where I hold my breath, you know, and I only realize... Breathing is a scene. huge thing, yeah, I yeah. mean, from the beginning, even his exhale, and then they die together. When she dies, it's them just breathing together. Yeah. Um, that, that was always a big part of, um, of the music of the movie also, starting with the fact that he was asthmatic, Lenny, and he had the deviated septum, so... Mm. And later in life, you could hear him. You can hear him breathing on recordings of his conducting. We don't have Carrie here, but I'd love for you to speak a little bit about working with her and developing this really uh, incredible on-screen connection. The truth is, there's the only reason we were able to be so bold cinematically is because of her. She's just the most incredible actor. And that, for example, that Thanksgiving Day scene, you know, she was able to just deliver that with such a rhythm and pace that we were able to stay in that wide shot. And if, if, it, if it wasn't for that, there's no way. And, and the same thing for the so many shots that just we were able to stay on her, like when she's at the palm court talking about how she actually misses Lenny, that we were able to stay on that close-up the whole time, um, which was just thrilling to watch. Um, and we really felt like we watched a person when they were 25, we met them, and then we watched them start to get die. It was, and it, it, was, was, it was really sad. It was devastating. It was really devastating. Yeah, I mean, like, we had know. a week of her, I mean, of us filming her dying, but I mean, it was just like, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't, we're, nobody's going to lunch on those days, you know, yeah. we're just like, you know, she was kind of taking care of us. Yeah, we were yeah it was crying. crazy. I mean, it was basically like it was just like the movie. Like, let me take care of your friends. Yeah, and and the, and the family. But at the end, it was uh, it was rough. You know, because her performance is so good that you know, even just you know, on the technical side, just sitting behind equipment, you're just sitting there watching, it and you're just stunned at the the performance. And it's not surprising because she's amazing, but it's also just she it hits you something. every time. Yeah, she really. Uh, yeah, and that's unusual. You know, crews are sometimes jaded, and this is not those moments where you're just watching it and awe. Uh, the camera loves her and you, you can understand why yeah. every moment. Bradley, I'd love to close by asking you about a word you've used to describe Lenny, uh, which is fearlessness. Um, and you said you had to bring that, you had to bring that to this film yourself uh, because of that. What did that look like for you? In the film? Yeah, as a, as a director, have fearlessness. Um, what did it look like? I mean, like the result of it, or like how did it manifest on? Set? Yeah, like how did what did being fearless mean to you on this movie? I guess it meant um, staying calm and and waiting for the idea to arrive rather than trying to muscle it. That that that, that was the biggest difference I felt from A Star Is Born to Maestro. Is I was def I was so much more relaxed and calm and um, and and patient with uh, waiting, knowing that the movie was going to tell me what I, what the right direction to go in. Um, and that felt pretty, like it had, that happens like it felt like a fearless quality because you have like, you know, 400 people. <laughs> if you want to take a second and think about if this is the right thing. But I just felt, I always felt like Lenny was with me, so I, w I never felt alone. I mean, I would say fearless in the sense that you shoot a, you know, three minute, fight scene with no, an argument scene with no coverage, nothing to fall back on, just here's how it plays, you know, here's how it's planned. I, I mean, to me that's, you know, I haven't seen a director do that in a long time where you just, you just, okay, this is the only shot we're going to use, and that's it. You know, nothing to fall back on, that's fearless. I would agree. Oh, thanks. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, thanks for staying. Thank you.